Firstly, Annabelle, I mean, there are many people in the audience who haven't actually seen the first original version of Pressure uh, from the late 70s. So just how different is it for you watching this restored version? It's like chalk and cheese, to be honest. I mean, I haven't seen Pressure except in its original format for years and years and years. And the, the texture, the color, everything is completely different, vibrant. It just looks amazing. I mean, what has been done is fantastic. And we're all thrilled and delighted that BFI have decided to do it. To be honest, it's a great honor. Horace would be thrilled, let's say that. Um, Herbert, um, for me, Tony is probably one of the most iconic characters in British cinema, if I can say. Yeah. And um, did you have any idea um, when you auditioned and were part of the film um, about how important it was? But also, what was the impact on you as an actor coming through? Um, no, I didn't have a clue that years on, uh, the film will still be um, relevant. Um, as an impact, I said when I was younger, I was more or less going through, through the same thing as the character, you know, because I was more or less about to leave school. And I could see my friends and some of my family going through the same thing, going for a job, they couldn't find a job, et cetera, et cetera, coming home depressed, you know? But um, me being, at the time, an actor, it was hard for me to get parts. So when this part did come up, and as Annabelle probably know, it was kind of destined, wasn't it? <laughs> because what it was, I was at um, an acting school called Anna Shears, and, yeah, yeah, Anna Scher's in there. <laughs> right on, brother. <laughs> and, um, no, um, I, I was auditioning, Anna said to me, oh, they've got people coming in to audition me for a film. Not only me, but some of the other black guys that was there at the time. And uh, I remember auditioning for Annabelle, Rob, and Horace. And that was a Friday night. And when the drama club had finished, um, Horace and uh, Rob turned around to me and said, well, look, we've got somebody else to audition, you know? We don't know if we've got the part, we've got somebody else. And they said, well, um, where's this person live? And they said, oh, this person lives in such and such a place. So I said, oh, you know what? I live around that area, and because I was in Islington at the time, and for me to get home that particular night, would have been about an hour and a half plus, and being like 14, 15, you think, mm, and that's a long journey on the bus. So I said, mm, oh, they're, they're, going, they're going my direction. So I'll punt a lift, you know? So I said, um, I can show you around that area. I know that area. So they said to me, oh, jump in the car. And that was Rob's Beetle, yeah. the, the red one, what you saw in the, in the thing. So I've jumped in there and we're driving along, we're going along and having a good chat. And they're saying, you know, they say, yeah, turn here, turn right, go there, go up there, yeah, thank you. Anyway, where do you live? I live up just up there. So they've pulled up inside, outside, and I've jumped out the car. And as I'm jumping out the car, I think it was Annabelle or somebody went, hold on a minute. This is the address we're supposed to go to interview the next person for the part. Well, goes, well, that's where I live. You know? They went, are you? Yeah, that's me. So, oh my goodness, we're going to interview you for the part. So, yeah. so basically all they had to do was to go inside and say to my mom, could you be in the film? You know, and she went, yeah. So <laughs> it was destined, as they said, you know. Wow, amazing story. Mm. <laughs> um, Ria, um, as a emerging young filmmaker, um, who's interested, of course, in ideas, representation, and blackness as well. What kind of textual influences do you take from pressure? Um, what I like about Horace Survey's work, like in general, but particularly in pressure, is the aesthetics of the work, the fact that it can um, start by adhering to a documentary realism and then go into this 
more experimental, let's say, um, dream sequence. And I think that's so interesting to me as a filmmaker, having um, be underlining those things that are all in the film that Tony's living in a world that isn't hospitable to him, that there are many systems of oppression that are working against him. Um, so maybe that that story needs to be told in a, in a different way, in a different aesthetics with a different narrative. That's really inspiring to me as a filmmaker to think about how um, I can use more experimental means or images which don't really hold themselves together and um, which kind of, uh, yeah, might tell an experience that's uh, countercultural or, or or not mainstream, uh, yeah. Uh, Cal, um, for those who obviously are too young uh, to understand, um, how would you describe the public, cultural, political impact of pressure when it's finally released uh, to the public in the late 70s? Well, um, it's I mean, it really was only in the late 70s that people began to think that there'd been a full, or there was beginning to be a full articulation of the anxieties of what we call the second generation. I suppose most people would date that articulation of the frustrations to Linton's Dread Beaten Blood in 1978. Um, what's so moving about this film is as ever, Horace got there first. Um, he he was he was always ahead of the curve, um, and somebody was saying that earlier this evening in the first panel about the images of the skinheads in the reggae film. Um, how he noticed what was going on. How Horace could always see. He had an incredibly clear eye. Um, so it's very moving to see the, the degree to which Horace was interested in my generation, Herbie's generation. Um, it's also worth noting, um, as a writer who worked with Horace um, and talked to Horace a lot about writing, Horace um, was a surrealist, as it becomes clear in this film. He wasn't just a social realist. Um, he had a real full understanding of the grammar of film. And his favorite filmmaker was Louis Bunuel. And that scene with the pig is classic Bunuel. Um, and the final thing I want, I want to say on, you know, in, in response to your question is, it's important to also realize that he wrote this script with Sam Selvon. And Sam Selvon wrote probably the most important articulation of the Windrush generation's anxieties in his 1956 novel, The Lonely Londoners. But shortly after finishing this film, Sam Selvon left Britain for Canada. And one of the things he said was that he couldn't really understand this emerging generation of black Britons. He didn't really know what to do with this. Um, and it's really profoundly moving, I think, that Horace not only knew what to do with it, but the rest of his career he dedicated um, to following up on a lot of the themes that we saw in pressure. Um, I do want to kind of get in one or two questions from the public um, according to the time, but before I do, I've got one utopian question for the panel. Um, in the corner over there, uh, I'm going to embarrass them now, um, are a group of young people, uh, young black people from the Avenues Youth Project, uh, which is based in West London on the Harrow Road, uh, minutes from Labour Grove where this film is set. And I've been working with them for a number of months and I wanted them here this evening so those young black people could see what the other generation before them, how they existed and lived in West London as they breathe and walk and feel it now. So with that in mind, uh, the token question is this, if we were ever to invest in another iteration of pressure that dealt with 2023 and beyond, in what ways would a producer, an actor, a filmmaker, a writer, how would you grapple with the current pressure for those young people? 
how would you depict or approach a narrative about young black people living in West London today? Um, well, I wouldn't presume to speak for them. Uh, uh, I think that, I mean, it, the discussion earlier was centered around um, how black filmmakers could make a film today and where the funding is and where the commissioning is. And to make a film like that, I actually don't think it's with like a mainstream television channel, like someone said it earlier, like a lot of really great work in the 70s, 80s came out of the black film workshops because they had no kind of string, they had no strings really. Um, attached to the work that they were making, or it was a lot more free. And as someone who makes um, very experimental work, I think that uh, the ability to depict, uh, you know, where you're coming from, your point of view, your perspective um, relies on having those resources given to you without much stipulation on how you should use them. And so, um, yeah, I don't want to speak for what West London might be because it's not my experience. But um, yeah, I do want to speak for how that work gets made. I think if I was in any sort of situation to deal with something like that, I'd have to do a, an awful lot of research, to be honest. Um, I wouldn't dream to think that I know what is the situation going on in West London right now with young black people. I, I don't know. I've lived in Trinidad for the last 25 years, so I'm not that I'm completely out of the loop. I don't think change. I don't think as much change has happened as we would have liked from back when we made pressure. We hoped that things would be way ahead of what they are now. I think, but I would have to do a lot of research to feel in any way truthful about current day West London. To be honest, I think. Um When you look back, when we made pressure, Horace, as you said, was a visionary. He spoke about a lot of things back then that's more or less happening now, you know? And you think to yourself, okay, so if years on, these things are still happening, yeah, it makes you think to yourself, okay, how is the uh, youth today coping with it, you know? Would they cope with it the way we coped with it back then? But it's different in the way they now have social media and anything that goes wrong, in an instant, it's there. And you've got people now who will be going, well, that's not right. What's happening here? What's going on here? Back then, we didn't. Back then, if anything went wrong, we had to battle it out. There's no social media. There's no people saying, hold on a minute, that's wrong, that's right, that's this, that's different. It was none of that. You know, you had voices, but the voices was, was not heard. Or if they were heard, people would ignore it because, ooh, we don't want to touch that subject, you know? And I think today with the generation, they're more open to say, hold on a minute, that's not right. Because social media now is global. Mm -hmm. So if I say something today, two minutes from now, it's in New York. You know, whereas back then you say something now, um, back then, and it was pushed under the carpet. Or six months later will come out when everything's like, hush, hush, we don't talk about that. You know, so I think the generation now has got a good platform to actually explain himself and stand up for themselves and say, hold on, that's not right. Yeah? Because of social media. Well, we're not post police brutality. No. So it's a different time, but the essential to, to use Horace's word, the essential pressures are not too different from what they were. Um, you know, the, the scaffolding of 
which is surrounding the arguments or surrounding the the um, the two different situations might be different, but fundamentally, you know, uh, the film speaks to us across nearly half a century because we recognize what's going on. We can see, I mean, I, there was a moment towards the end of that film where I was totally reminded of everything that's happened since October the 7th in how to respond and the sort of the language of brutality, what to do about this situation. So. I think in so many different ways it, it, it remains relevant because we still live in that same world. I think, I think as I was discussing with Harvard earlier, that I don't think for one minute when we made pressure in 1974, we thought that it was going to have the longevity that it has. And the reason that it has is because it's still relevant. The, the problems are not the same, but they are in some fundamental way the same. People are facing the same issues. It still exists. Suella Braverman exists. <laughs> you know, all that crap still go. You know, it, we haven't gone as far ahead as we thought we would have done when we were making that film in 1974. We thought 50 years hence, we're not going to have to even be talking about this. And that, I think, is the legacy of the movie. Wow, thank you. An amazing uh, way to conclude. Uh, unfortunately, we do have to wrap up now, but please join me in giving a wonderful round of applause to Eddie. Thank you. Eddie. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.